It's Parm King. I'm really excited to bring you another guide to Curse of Straw. This one is the Coffin Maker Shop in the village of Velaki. Now, first of all, I want to apologize to you. I did miss last week's, week's video. Um, I wasn't feeling well the week earlier and I took a little sabbatical to recharge my battery and clear my head. I want to thank all of you that sent me uh, well wishes to get better soon. I'm doing great. Um, and I was really, really surprised and just kind of overwhelmed with how many Patreon members joined up uh, this last week when I was recharging my battery. So I'm almost at 100 Patreon members at 99. Huge thank you for your support out there and your well wishes. Thank you so much. And it really helped me recharge my batteries and let me know that you like the content that I'm producing to jump back in here. So we have this one. Uh, the Blue Water Inn is almost done. I'll be releasing that here shortly. Again, a big shout out and thank you to DM Andy. DM Andy makes all these beautiful battle maps that you see in these Curse of Strahd guides. If you like his maps and you're playing on a tabletop or Roll20, uh, they're available in grid, non-grid, day, night, weather effects. I put a link to DM Andy's Patreon down below. Uh, make sure you uh, say thank you to him because he's also gracious enough to allow us to use these battle maps in our Foundry Adventure modules. That's right, every one of these modules are produced also in PDF form and Foundry Adventure modules. These modules you can just download, install, and it includes everything, the maps, the walls, the characters, the links back to D&D Beyond, the music, everything you see here, just with a click of the button and you're ready to go. So let's jump in here, and again, huge shout out, big thank you to the Patreon members uh, and your well wishes. They were well received. So let's talk about this beautiful map and this encounter, which of course, as you probably already know, I made some changes in here, little tweaks and twists in there to make it a little bit more exciting, perhaps a little different. So here we are, this is gonna be two maps. We got the ground floor map, we got the top floor map. Now the ground floor map, you're gonna notice here on this, again, this gorgeous map, that DM Andy put together. I've already done all the walls and lighting, so you can see the candle lighting in here. You've got the wall here to the stockyard. Now, if you haven't seen the stockyard module, you should watch that, because there's some tie-ins from the stockyard murder mystery uh, into the coffin maker, and also St. Andrew's uh, Church and Cathedral. That whole mystery about the bones are tied into this as well. So I highly suggest watching those two videos. If you haven't looked at those guides or read those guides either, they'll be really helpful uh, for this. So let's talk about the Coffin Maker Shop itself. Now, the Coffin Maker Shop is a sad looking building. It's kind of decrepit and seen better days. There's a worn uh, uh, coffin, worn sign that's shaped like a coffin hanging there. It says kind of faded rest in peace. One thing that the players will notice is that all the shutters are shut. And that just seems kind of odd. It stands out because not all the buildings in Velaki have all their shutters shut. Now, here down below, by the way, this is a, a thumbnail of James RPG Art. He has done these matte paintings, included animated ones for Curse of Strahd. I'll put a link to him down below in the bottom. If you are playing on a tabletop or you're using Roll20 uh, or Foundry or, or any of those, uh, he makes these animated ones and having those up on a screen for Theater of the Mind, they're just really, really nice. And I got a little thumbnail here of it and there's a link down below to his animated versions of it. So this gives you kind of a, a, a view of what this this coffin maker shop looks like from the outside. Now again, my DM notes are all in secret. You can see them here. And um, I put some questions in here. So your, your players are going to approach the coffin maker shop really from two different scenarios. Either they're at St. Andrew's uh, Church, they've learned about the missing bones, and they're now questioning people in town, or the players have been at the stockyard and they realize that there's a murder been committed and they're gonna learn about Henrik, the coffin making shop from there. So they're, they're, there's two different approaches that they can come to the coffin maker shop. And I wanna make sure that we address these separately. It could be at the same time or separately. So if the players come and knock on the door, uh, Henrik will open, there's gonna be like a small little door window. He's gonna open it up, he's gonna stare out and he's gonna say, Oh, my apologies, I'm currently closed, but if my services are required, I, may I suggest you visit uh, Father Petrovich, who can arrange the services you need, and I'll be happy to coordinate with the Father. Now, 
The reason Henrik's going to say this to you is, well, he's a coffin maker and you're a band of adventurers, your party is, and he's going to assume that, you know, he's you're contacting him to make a coffin. So it's kind of a way of excusing himself, saying he's closed. So he's obviously not interested in talking. He's just going to be talking through this little door. He won't open up the door. He'll be talking through this little window door, if you will. Now, if the players, however, mention they might have already met uh, Conic Halflinger, he's the owner of the cart and wheel. He's also the town Wainwright, the other woodworker, who is close friends with Henrik, the coffin maker. So if he goes, oh, we we met, your players say, we met with Conic Halflinger, he's going to go, oh, okay, come on in. So th that's a way to get that door open if they've mentioned the, the Wainwright. And they may learn that, that Conic Halflinger is friends with Henrik the Coffin Maker. So that, that could be an opening there. Now, if they're approaching this uh, entire engagement because they've learned that the bones of uh, the skull of St. Andrew has been stolen, they're going to be coming here and asking questions like, uh, do you know Malavoy? And he's going to say, yes, yes, he is the groundskeeper, the the grave digger of the church, he, he helps me carry coffins in to the graveyard and digs the graves. That will be true, and that's pretty much all he's going to say about Melavoy. Now, if your players ask, do you know about the missing bones or skull of St. Andrew? He's going to go, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, please go away. You're going to, that question is going to disturb him. He's going to try to excuse himself. If you're talking through the door, he's going to, going to say, hey, go away, and he's going to close the door. I don't know what you're talking about. Or if he's, if you've managed to gain entry, he's going to go, I'm quite busy now. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, you're going to have to leave now. Now, if the players do roll a perception check, they're going to realize he's lying. He's trying to hide something. Now, the players are going to find out the truth if they engage him only one of three ways. And this is delicate. This is about role playing here. And it's kind of important because you don't want the players to always just coming in and kind of throttling people and, and trying to beat the truth out of them. So if they confront him, they're going to learn one of two things. They're either going to, by because they're looking at the for the bones of St. Andrew and they've questioned the grave digger already, the grave digger is going to tell them, yeah, I, I, I sold the skull of St. Andrew to Henrik, the coffin maker, gave me 50 gold for it. So they're going to know because Melavoy is going to tell them. Or perhaps they're on the stockyard murder quest and they've questioned some people and they're going to go, hey, wait, Yelena, the victim, saw Henrik putting bodies in crates and moving those crates into the coffin maker shop. So if he's confronted with one of those truths, either Melavoy gave him the skull or the victim, the murder victim, saw him putting bodies in a crate and moving those crates into his coffin maker shop, uh, or if he's intimidated at DC 15, he's going to tell them this. And this is kind of the truth. This is going to kind of flesh everything out. I don't think the players can persuade him. If they want to run a persuasion check, I let them roll it, but they'd always fail. And if the players kind of harass him too much, he's going to ask them to go away. He's not going to answer any questions. I really think uh, this is an important aspect where you want to role play where they either know something that he's done and he's confronted it with it. Uh, or he's just going to kind of, uh, you know, ask them to leave. So if he's confronted with it, he's not going to lie. He's just going to say, okay, well, one night, several months ago, a Vistani visited with some business. The Vistani had some bodies that needed coffins uh, made for a proper burial. He delivered six bodies to the stockyard, and we loaded the bodies into crates, and we moved them into my coffin shop. I made the coffins, but I... I didn't feel right about it. There was something wrong. I thought perhaps it was the Vistani curse or something. I left the crates with the bodies up in the uh, storage room upstairs. And when Melavoy told me about the skull he heard about at St. Andrew's Church, I, I shared that information with the, about the skull with the Vistani, who was very interested in it. In fact, he gave me a hundred gold pieces to acquire the skull. I, I asked Melavoy to, if he could acquire it, I would split it with him. And Melavoy brought me the skull and... Then the Vistani asked me if I could deliver the coffins to St. Andrew's Church to, to, for burial before the, the Feast of St. Andrew, and he would be paying me a, another, gold, uh, another gold for my efforts. I offered again half to Milavoy payment if he could help me uh, acquire the skull, which he did, and, and then help me move these, these bodies into the coffins and, and then take them to the church. Uh, the Vistani has never come to pick up 
the skull that I've acquired, and well, I'm still waiting for Milavoy to help me move these 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 bodies into the into the coffins and the coffins to the church. And so he's going to share that with him. Uh, clearly, at this point, because you've confronted him with two known truths, he's not going to lie. You've caught him in the lie, and so he's going to tell you this. Now, I've also put in here um, the Q and A's from the murder. Uh, mystery murder of Yelena in the stock area, which is right next door. This is the same uh, Q&A uh, questions and answers um, from that line of questioning. I just put it in here because you're probably going to ask him the questions. I just thought it'd be easier to have them in here. So those are the kind of the, the two ways I see the players engaging with Henrik the coffin maker, either again from the searching for the skull of St. Andrews or trying to solve the murder mystery from the stockyard next door. So that takes us right into the map here. So uh, here he is, there's Henrik right down here. He's gonna e either engage the party in this door here by his word working shop, or they're gonna knock at this door up here. So let's look at each of these door, each of these rooms. And one of the things that, well, it was a little frustrating to me, and if you're familiar with Curse of Strahd, uh, you had the book or on D&D Beyond, there's really nothing in this coffee maker, maker shop. So I added a few little items in there, and I've kind of changed the spawn encounter a little bit, the vampire spawn encounter, which we'll get to here shortly, which I'm kind of excited about. So this room is kind of musty. There's some new coffins that are laid out here on display and some other ones. Again, the players are going to notice that the shutters are closed and locked. And the only thing the players can assume is, well, maybe they, he just doesn't want this morbid sight of seeing coffins by passerbys. And that's pretty much what, the, what you're probably going to assume. Now, if you head down here to the next room, which is, I changed this. Now, in Curse of Strahd, this is just called the junk room. And I just thought, well, that's kind of a, that's kind of a cop out. I, I call it the finishing shop. So, you know, I imagine, and, and again, I'm going to blame you, DM Andy. DM Andy made these gorgeous coffins, right, with the, the lining in the coffin and very nice. I just figured, you know, the, the coffin maker has a finishing shop. And in the finishing shop, this is where he's working on the interiors and the fine work and the finishing work and the hinges for each of the coffin. There's a lantern hanging from the ceiling over a tabletop. There's some small tools for finishing work and details. The cabinets are lined the walls with various items to decorate the coffins. There's some rolls of material here to line the coffins, maybe some silk and stuff, or metal bars for making hinges and, and other items. So this is, I call this the finishing shop. This is where he's taking the coffin. And you want to line some silk in there or some, or put some nice detailed work on it. This is where that's going to be done. So I have some items in here for the players that they can get. There's a, there's a small knife. There's, there's cotton here. There's silk. So there's some items. I just want to give the players some items that they can get. You know, there's some copper bar in here. There's some Smith tools. Again, there's a link back to D and D Beyond if you have D and D Beyond and you want to look at it. But there's, there's really not much of a description in here. Uh, this description is quite a bit more. The, the next room we have over here is the work, workshop. Again, there wasn't much of a description in here. I put a couple more tools in here, the wood carver's tools, a hammer, a small knife. It, the, the workshop's well lit. There's coffin in various stages of being built. Again, I mean, this is th these detailed maps that, that DM Andy puts together. I mean, you can see, I'll just move this over so you can see what a great job he's done. I'll just zoom way in here. I mean, you got stuff on the tables. You've got the saw with the wood. You've got one of these coffins. He's got, you know, building the frame to the coffin. So they're in various stages of being made. Just, again, it just adds to the detail and the atmosphere. Now, I imagine if he does let you in, he's not going to, He's you're going to have the conversation most likely here in the workshop. So let's go ahead and move upstairs where the real action takes place. So we'll zoom in again up here um, and we'll talk about, we'll, we'll start with the kitchen over here. So the kitchen here is, the kitchen looks like it's well stocked. There's a table setting for two, perhaps there was a guest, and there's a door that leads here to the north. Now I added this in here, there's really other no other description. I wanted to put this in here to tie in the backstory again with Conic Halflinger, which ties into the murder mystery, or if they meet with Conic Halflinger uh, in the, the town square. Um, if they ask, hey, it looks the table looks like it's set for, for two, he's gonna say, oh yes, Conic, Conic Halflinger was here. We had some, he's the, he owns the, uh, the cotton wheel. He's the town's Wainwright. We had some, some cheese and wine earlier. He was asking me to help him with some woodworking there at his shop. That ties in 
to their alibis uh, for the murder mystery um, if you're doing the murder mystery at the stockyard. And if they do talk to Connick Halflinger, he's going to go, yes, I, I was over there at uh, Henrik's shop uh, having some wine and cheese discussing working on the, uh, one of the, uh, the wagons that I needed some help with, some of his woodworking expertise. So they, they can, you know, it's an alibi exchanging things there. So I wanted to, I like adding those little bit of details in there so it's not just like, well, there's a kitchen. You know, and there's some stuff on the shelves. You, you want to put those little details because that's what fills in, you know, reinforces those clues as you're solving this mystery. Now we're going to go up to the bedroom. Again, I did a couple of things here in the bedroom. Uh, you're going to notice, again, uh, DM Andy, there's a little viola there sitting on the, uh, on the stand. He's a woodworker, so I imagine I put that item in here. Um, you know, he, he plays. You can actually add that into your role playing. He's made this viola. Maybe Connick Halflinger comes over there and they play music together. They're, uh, Henrik, the coffin maker's only friend, is Connick. They're the two woodworker, uh, woodmakers in town. So it's quite likely they get their string instruments, their lute and viola, and they play a little music together. The other thing the players are going to notice in here, there's a dagger on the table. So there's two items the players can take from this room. Um, now... Uh, and I put in there, uh, Henrik plays the viola, so that's that's mentioned in here as well. Now, if the players do search the room, it's a DC uh, perception check of 15. They're going to find this small wooden box with St. Andrew's skull in it. They're also going to find a leather pouch with 50 gold pieces. Remember, he received 100 gold pieces. He was going to give 50 to Melavoy to get the skull. Melavoy is going to have the other 50 gold pieces. Now, the players will notice when they're looking at this bag of 50 gold pieces, they don't have to roll for this. They're going to notice right away that there's one odd, strange, larger coin in there. Henrik will be surprised. He legitimately didn't notice the coin in there. He was given the bag of 100 gold pieces. He just pulled out 50, paid Melavoy, never really looked at it again. But the players are going to see this unusual coin in there. And it is a large, larger coin, and it's a strawed coin. It's got Strahd's face on it. It's worth 10 gold pieces. Now, why is this important, and how did it get mixed in the bag? Well, two things to remember. It was the Fastani that is paying Henrik to bury these bodies. And they gave him 100 gold pieces in this leather pouch. So the players are going to realize, well, this is the leather pouch that Vistani paid him. But why is there a straw coin in it? This is the clue that those bodies and those Vistani have something to do with straw. This should be one of those, you know, those little pause moments. There's a straw coin in here. That's peculiar. Henrik's not going to remember seeing it. He goes, I, I, did, you know, I just pulled out 50 gold paid Melavoy and, and kept the other in there. So the only reason this is in there is to, to you know, click that light bulb in your player's head. There's something else here amiss. And it's really a clue to who the Vistani were working for in that these bodies that are brought here are probably in some way, shape, or form tied to Strahd. Uh, again, here's the skull of St. Andals. Uh, Andals. It is here. It's in a box. Uh, uh, for the players to take back. Um, so the players are going to get this skull one of two ways. Either they, They've either busted in here and started searching and found it, or perhaps Henrik's going to tell them uh, where to find it, and if they have enough time to get it back to the church and get it properly buried, they can avoid the, uh, the, the vampire spawn just tearing the church to shit, which you can see in the St. Andrew's uh, video. So that's what we have here in the bedroom. And let's go ahead and jump into the main action here, which is going to be in the storage room up here. Now, I call this the storage room upstairs. And, you know, the room is dusty. There's cobwebs covering the ceiling. It seems to be a storage room for wood. And the wood is cut, and it seems to be used for drying lumber before cutting into coffins. I was thinking to myself, you know, Velaki's damp. The whole area is damp and cold. Um, he probably wants this wood to dry out, you know, and you want wood, as a woodworker, you want to work with dry wood. And so he just stores wood up here that he's going to be making the coffins up here to dry out. And so that's why there's so much wood up here. And I wanted to give a reason, you know, he's drying the wood out to make coffins. That's why they're up here. Now, if Henrik has confessed about the bodies that are in the crates, he've already told the players that there's some crates up here, um, you know, that he brought to the top floor that had the bodies in it. If not, they're not, they're, they're, the crates are still going to be here. They just won't know that there's any bodies in here. Now, again, at this point, the players just think there's bodies in these crates. They don't know anything about any um, vampire spawn. If you've done this correctly, there's just some dead bodies in these crates that Vastani dropped off. You know, it is suspicious. They found the strawed coin. 
this Fistani was interested in the skull, that, you know, the players might start putting some clues together. But again, it's just, you know, some dead bodies in here. Now, one of the things I want to talk about briefly here before we jump into this for Foundry players, each one of these boxes is actually um, a, a um, what do you call this here, a... Uh, a tile. So I just put, I just made them as tiles so you can create more of them and just move them around uh, in here and place them where you want to. So feel free to move the, the, the um, tokens or the tiles where you want. Now let's talk about the vampire spawn themselves. And you're going to notice that there's some different looking vampire spawn in here. In fact, each one looks different. And this is the big change I made to it. Now this is a combat encounter in and it's a pretty deadly combat encounter. And I wanted to make it something special because there's really nothing else at the coffin maker shop. I mean, there's two, two mysteries. You've got the mystery of the missing skull. You've got the, the, uh, the murder mystery going on. But you've got this combat encounter. And this is a pretty significant one in the town of Lockie. Now, I made these vampire spawns as adventurers in previous life. I had mentioned these were a band of adventurers very much like your players, your party. And these adventurers, who are now vampire spawn, still remember each other. They remember being coming to Barovia. They came and tried to defeat Strahd, and obviously they failed. They were turned into vampire spawn, and now they're minions who serve Strahd under complete influence of Strahd. Now, each one of these vampire spawns has their original weapon that they used in life. And one of them is a wizard, and they have one spell. So they're not just vampire spawns. These are adventurers that have become vampires. Now, why is this important for a couple of reasons? Well, number one, this is gothic horror, and this is some foreshadowing. I really wanted to set this up so that when your players are engaging with these, they're going to go, wait, these, these look like adventurers. That guy looks like a paladin. That's a, that's a ranger and a rogue. Could this be our fate? If we fail, uh, is this our destiny? If we do not defeat Stride, will we too become uh, vampire spawn? Uh, minions for Strahd? So this is one of these kind of uh, gloomy, doom, foreshadowing things. It's just, this is just not random vampire spawns. These are adventures just like your players that are now vampires attacking your players. Now, the other thing I wanted to do in here is, because this is a pretty deadly encounter, is I wanted to leave your players with some magical items. So each one of these vampire spawns has a magical item that's associated with them in life. Now, I put in here some interesting vampire rules for this engagement. So let's talk about the engagement, the attack, uh, and then two of these kind of vampire rules I threw in here. Um, the first thing is the engagement. So the vampires are going to attack relentlessly without mercy. If the players disturb one of the boxes uh, that has supposedly the dead body in it, which is the vampire spawn, they don't even have to really open it. They just need to disturb it, and it's going to wake all of them up. As soon as one wakes, they're all awake. You're going to jump into combat encounter immediately. Now, uh, if the players begin to retreat, like, oh, shit, we just woke up these vampire spawns, they decide to bolt and head down the stairs, the vampire uh, uh, are going to chase them and continue to attack them throughout the coffin maker shop. Or if they jump out the windows, they're going to chase them on the grounds. Now, if the, if the players leave this map, if they, they leave the grounds of the coffin maker, the vampire spawn will not chase them beyond the grounds. And when the players do come back or they come back with help or guards, the vampires will be gone. They have retreated. And I'll explain what happens but you'll see it's pretty cool. So the vampires will attack them, chase them through the building, chase them on the grounds, but if the players retreat and, and leave, the vampires are not gonna follow them. They're gonna disappear. When the players come back, they're gonna be gone. Um, let's talk about how the vampires attack. These aren't normal vampire spawns. I like to think of these as um, they have their, their muscle memory for battle when they were adventurers, and they're vampires um, so they have this lust for, for drinking blood. So when they're in combat, they're going to be using their weapons to attack because that's what they knew in life. That's what they trained to do. These adventurers, these six adventurers know each other. So they're going to be using their weapons to attack. 
However, when they get close or see this opportunity, um, the, 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 the vampire bloodlust in them is going to come out and they're going to try to grapple and bite uh, one of the players if they see that as an opportunity. Otherwise, they're going to interact and attack the players as they were in life. And I'll go through each one of them and explain to you uh, how that works. Now, every one of the vampires has a weapon. Vampire spawns have multiple attacks. Usually it's two claws attack or a grapple and a bite. But what I did in here is each of these vampire spawns can attack with their dagger or their short sword twice. So they have mul everyone has multiple attack. They're gonna use their weapons except when they see that opportunity to go in for the grapple and the bite, right? So uh, I imagine them, they're attacking as they were in life and they this lust, this vampire fervor comes over them. They're just gonna grapple onto the player and try to bite them. So I imagine the, the, the grapple and the bite more of being this kind of, this inner uh, energy vampire kind of overtaking their uh, ability to control themselves to try to bite a player when they get in close. Now, there are two vampire reactions that I have in here. Remember, these vampires know each other in life. They are adventurers. They see each other. They value each other as adventurers, but they're under this control of straw. They are undead now, and they're being, uh, um, you know, they have this addiction. You know, they, they can't control the fact that they need to drink blood and they need to, to attack these players, and they're also under orders from Strahd. Um, but they still have this, this thread, this thread of, of connection. So when one of the vampires, if any one of these vampire spawns are killed, you're going to do what I call a vampire rage check. You're going to, as soon as one dies, you're going to roll a d20 die, just a straight d20. And if it's 12 or higher, the vampires are going to go into a rage. And what they're going to do, if you, if you succeed this, they're all going to stop what they're doing, and they're going to look at the player that, let, that dealt the killing blow or the killing spell on their their fellow adventurer. I mean, even though it's a vampire, it's undead, they're, they're still going to remember, hey, this was our buddy the rogue uh, or our buddy the ranger who's now dead. And those all those vampires, the other five vampires, are going to myopically focus on who dealt the killing blow. And they don't care about opportunity attacks. They care about nothing. They are going to focus. All of them are just going to focus on that one player and all five of them, or whoever's left, are gonna just attack that one player. They're gonna walk right past other players and they don't care about opportunity attacks. Remember, everything around them has just gone into this kind of zone myopic focus. We're gonna kill the person that killed our ally, our adventurer, you know, because there's still this threat of them being an adventurer. So that's what I call vampire rage. So as soon as a vampire goes down, you're gonna roll this D, uh, this vampire rage check, D12, uh, DC12 or higher, they're all going to focus on the one player. I also have this thing called vampire retreat. So if three or more of the vampires are killed, you're going to roll this vampire retreat check. Same thing. You're going to roll a D20, a 12 or higher, the vampires are going to realize we're overwhelmed. We need to regroup. And they're going to break through the windows and they're going to escape. They're going to try to escape and they're going to leave Velaki. Now let's talk about this vampire retreat because I mentioned it earlier. Remember, if, the, if they chase the players, the players are retreating, they chase the players. As soon as the players leave the coffin maker, the grounds of the coffin maker, the vampires don't chase them anymore and they disappear. Or in this case, the vampires retreat and disappear. What happened to these vampires? This is a little fun thing to put in your back pocket. Any of the vampires that escape and live, right? Whether they retreat from this, this retreat mechanism mechanic or whether the players retreated and they chased them and the players left and the, and the vampires disappeared. The vampires are gonna come back. They're gonna remember two things. Number one, these vampires were on a mission. Remember, they were gonna be put into the coffins, moved to St. Andrews, and just wipe out the church and kill Father uh, Petrovich. That was their mission. Strahd gave them this mission. And the players interrupted this mission. And the players may have killed one of their friends. They are now vampires on epic revenge. So as soon as your players leave Velaki, maybe they're heading to Kresk or the Wizard's Tower or down to uh, Argenvost. Maybe they're resting on the road. Whatever vampire survived, when your players least expect it, maybe they're in a long rest on the side of the road, these vampires are going to descend and go right into combat. These vampires are going to replace one of your random combat encounters on the road after the players leave Velaki. So 
these vampires going, hey, uh, we failed Strahd's mission and we need to show Strahd that we're punishing the people that failed this mission. Number two, these are the guys that killed one of our buddies, so we're going to go after them. So these are now like revenge vampire spawns at this point. So that's what's going to happen if any of the vampires disappear. You want to, you, you know, you want to play this well. This is this is going to be a slow burn, right? You want to make sure the players have forgotten about it. Oh, three of the vampires got away. They go on, la da da, do some more of their quests, solve the murder mystery, bring the skull back. You know, they're on their way to in you know, the wizard's tower. You go, well, I'm not going to enter it yet. You know, maybe from the wizard's tower to Kresk. But you want to just drop it in there when they least expect it. You know, and the players are all focused. Well, I got, you know, I got to redo my spell slots, a long rest. That right when they least expect it, you're going to bring these vampires back. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to say, roll, roll initiative. And they're going to go, what? And, and then they're going to see these icons of these vampires. And they're going to go, oh, shit. Remember those vampires that got away? Holy shit. They're seeking revenge now. I mean, that's the kind of feeling impact that you want to, to lay into your players when they least expect to have these vampires come back. So let's talk about each of the vampires, and then I want to talk about balance and non-balance encounters. So we've got each of the vampires here. I've already placed them here on the map, but I want to talk about them a little bit. We've got really three kind of melee or tank adventures, and then we've got kind of three range attackers. Now, every one of these vampire stats are the same, except for they may have a weapon or one has a spell. That's the only thing different about them. But what you need to do as a dungeon master is play them as if they were playing who they were in life. So let's go through each one of them. In front row, we have the vampire barbarian. In life, he was a barbarian. The only thing different in this vampire spawn is he has a warhammer plus one. That's the magic item. If you kill this vampire spawn, he's going to drop a warhammer plus one. So I imagine him, he's just going to run into the front. He's just going to attack. He's this barbarian. Now, again, he does not have any of the rage at attributes, none of the, the specialty features that a typical barbarian has, but he still has that barbarian weapon. He's a vampire spawn, and he's going to behave like a barbarian. He's going to just charge in the front. He's going to be swinging this war hammer, and it's only when he sees that opportunity to go in for a grapple and a bite that the, the, that the uh, power of being a vampire is going to just overpowering his will, so he's going to uh, drop his war hammer and go in and grab for, for a bite. Now, if the uh, one of the players drop their weapons, they're going to definitely go to the claw attack, typical vampire spawn, claw attack and bite. But until then, he's going to be swinging this Warhammer plus one. Now remember, with their, these vampire spawns get multiple att attacks. So treat the weapon as two attacks. Every single vampire spawn is going to get two attacks with their weapon, just like they would get two attacks with their claws or a claw attack and a bite attack. So I'm going to treat this just like this. It's two attacks with a weapon or it's a claw grapple attack with a bite. The, that's the, the, the one, two blow that they're going to be doing. So they're going to typically stay with their weapon that they're comfortable with in life. That's their muscle memory for combat that they're going to be working with. So we got your vampire barbarian. I put him in the front row box. He's going to engage first. Right behind him, you had the vampire uh, fighter, just like the barbarian. This is a vampire. He's going to go in. He's going to charge forth. He has a two-handed great sword plus one great sword. He's going to go in there and just, you know, d dice and slice as best he can, just like he did in life. The other combatant is this vampire paladin. Now, he has a long sword. It's not a magical long sword, but it's at a plus one shield. So I upped the armor class plus one. Instead of the 15 armor class like the other vampire spawns, he has 16 because he has this plus one shield, and he's swinging his long sword and going in there. Again, if you kill any of these vampires, they're going to drop these magic items, great magic items to pick up. Okay, let's go into our range per people. We don't, this, the rogue is not really a range one. Um, I imagine I would play this still like a rogue. It's gonna try to go in. It's gonna try to attack. It's gonna look for ways of trying to disengage. It's not gonna have any of its sneak attack abilities, but it's gonna behave like a rogue. It's gonna try to find a way to kind of come in and flank or maybe get up on a wood pile and pounce down on the players. And this uh, rogue has uh, a multi-attack with a vicious dagger. Now. The Vicious Dagger is no big deal on its own. It's a, a D4, and I think with the Vampire, uh, vampire, it's going to be a plus 3. Let's just check that out see if I'm right. Uh, yeah, it's a D4 uh, plus 3. But it's a Vicious Dagger. If you roll a 20, it's going to add another 2D6. So it's going to have two attacks, and if it hits with that 2D6, you, you, could, be, you could be in for a shocker of a hit on one of your players. So... The, the rogue won't seem like a big deal, but 
I would say I'd be playing this rogue where it's going to try to get itself in a position to do this vicious dagger attack, but if it gets in close enough, you know, this is a rogue, it's going to go for the grapple and the bite. I would say that the rogue is going to try to grapple and bite before the paladin, the fighter, the, the, or the barbarian, which are going to be, you know, more kind of melee tank combatants. The rogue is going to try to go in for that opportunity, sweet kill like it used to do, a sneak attack, and all of a sudden that vampire lust is going to overcome them. Um, actually, she's a woman. She's a woman rogue. She's just going to go in there and grapple the player, just try to bite right and munch on the neck. Remember, this vampire bite is nasty. I mean, look at this thing here. I mean, this is not just a piercing attack. It's got that necrotic damage, and it's going to start reducing hit points. So whenever they have a chance to grapple and go in for a bite, they're going to do that. Otherwise, they're going to hit with their weapon. So I imagine her, the rogue, just because of her her past life, she's going to be the one that kind of tries to sneak in and, and grapple and bite as much, much as she can. The next one we have back here is the wizard. Now, this wizard's magic item is a ring of fire resistance, which goes for the single spell that he was able to remember in life, which is the cantrip fireball. He's going to fire two fireballs. Uh, sorry, not fireballs. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Stop, time out. Fire bolts. Just straight 1 DD. Uh, damage. Uh, I just made him a level one spellcaster. It's just a, a, a 1d10 worth of damage. So he's going to be sitting in the back firing off these fire, bolt, uh, fire bolts like he did in life. He gets, again, just like every other player, he's going to get two attacks with a fire bolt. So he's going to be a range attack vampire. Again, however, when the vampires goes down, you roll that rage, all, that, all those vampires are going to charge in onto one player. When, and I, when I imagine when they go onto rage, it's going to be kind of this combination of the rage of what they were like in life, plus that kind of vampire lust. They're just going to go in there and just go on a munch fest, just tear away at their claws. Just kind of, they're going to lose control. I just imagine losing control and pouncing on a player, all five of them trying to bite one player, just going crazy, forgetting about uh, opportunity attacks. I mean, they're going to go crazy if they rage. And, and the vampire wizard is going to do the same. He's going to stop firing these fire bolts. He's just going to Beeline it right for that player that took out one of his his adventurers. The last one we have over here is our vampire ranger. Again, he's going to have a plus one longbow and he's going to be firing those those arrows in there. Again, every every vampire spawn is going to get two attacks or that claw attack, which is really that grapple and that bite is what I would try to be what I would be trying to do here in this. So let's talk a little bit about, um, and I think it's important to talk about, is balance and non-balance. Now, there's two schools of thought. One is not right, one is not wrong. It's really up to you as the dungeon master and your types of players. And I wanted to talk about both of them because, you know, I don't know who's watching. Are you are your player that likes to, you're a DM that likes to balance encounters? Or are you a DM that doesn't like to balance encounters and, and introduce more role-playing or other elements? So let's talk about the balanced encounters first and some thoughts that I have about this particular encounter. Now, rules is written. This is six vampire spawns, CR5, 82 hit points of pop, multi-attacks. Those bites are certainly vicious. Even if you didn't make the changes like I did here, this is a pretty deadly encounter. And if you have four adventurers, level five, there's a good chance that one of them is going to go down in this encounter. How do I think about balancing encounters. Well, I think about it from three different points of view. The first thing I look at is how many uh, players do I have and what is their combat action economy? Meaning, is are they more spellcaster? Are they more melee uh, uh, attackers, etc.? Looking at how many players and the type of, of players that I have in that group. Now, the way I'm looking at this, if I have um, four or if, if I have five or six players, uh, and they're all level five or the appropriate level for the encounter, I mean, you can leave it rules as written. They're all 80. And I would change your hit points between, you know, 75 to 85. Everyone just slightly different. Don't make them all 82. I always like to differ them just a little bit, plus or minus a little bit, not all the same. Um, I think for five or six players at level five with a good mix of players, this is awesome. It works well. If you're at four players, especially three players, this is this might be overpowered for level five players. I would ratchet down and put a little note down here. I would take it down to maybe 70 hit points or 60 hit points per uh, vampire. You can also remove one of the vampires, make it five or make it four um, to, to fit with, with, the, with your player group, the size of your players and your CR rating. The second thing uh, I look at is what's the level of the players 
uh, and what um, kind of attacks they're doing. There's a huge thing that we forget about sometimes. When you go from like level three to level four, level four to level five, there's these huge steps where some of these uh, players are going to get an extra attack. So, I mean, if you're a barbarian and you're just doing one attack with a with a great weapon and all of a sudden you're doing multiple attacks, uh, you've just stepped up huge in the amount of damage that you're throwing out by just going up one level. So looking at the levels and looking at the kind of the attack loads or the offloading attacks that your players get to make, how much more additional actions or attacks they're going to be able to make uh, based on their level, is 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 pretty significant. If you were if this was a a group of five level seven players, they're gonna uh, they're gonna kick these vampires' butts. I think pr pretty quickly. Um, so look at those those the level of your players and and did they hit one of those big level pops? You know those level pops where they're gonna get some more action economy. Um, one of the things I like to think about is. Um, I'm usually thinking that these adventure ventures in that level four to level six range, on average per hit, they're going to be they're going to be laying down about ten damage per hit. I mean, I'm just rounding this out. I mean, sometimes it could be three, or sometimes it could be fourteen, but I just think about ten. So if I lower the uh, vampires by ten points from eighty to seventy, that's like t each one of these vampires already getting one hit. Right, so you've just taken out one round of hits out of each vampire. So if you load it, lowering it from 80 to 60, I think about it in my mind is like each of these vampires have already taken two average blows at that point. So that's another way of looking at it. Now the third thing I think about when I'm balancing encounters or thinking about encounters is something that kind of ties into unbalanced encounters, and that's player experience. One of the things that the mechanics and dice rolling and CR levels and player levels don't think about is player experience. Now, we all know this as players and as DMs, when we have newer players, they've really been focusing on the rules, learning the rules, and pretty much sticking things to rules as written. And so when you enter into a combat encounter, it's usually roll the dice, I'm a spellcaster, I'm casting spells, or I'm, I'm a melee fighter, or I'm a range fighter. And they don't think about all the other different opportunities or things they can do or taking advantage of the terrain or the environment. In fact, I've played in some games and DM games where players don't even understand the concept of, hey, maybe we should retreat, make a tactical retreat here. I mean, uh, combat encounters shouldn't be binary. Like, you know, we're going to fight until one of you guys lives or dies. Uh, yet, a lot of new players or non-experienced players, because they haven't thought about other things outside the box, uh, just play until everything is killed. We're going to play until everything dies. We die or they die. Uh, so um, one of those things I like to think about is what kind of players do I have? What kind of experience do they have? And that gets over to what I call the unbalanced encounter. So the second you know, school of thought is people that don't care about balance. Um, if you're an old school player, old school Renaissance OSR player, or you're an old D&D player, or if you play D&D when I did back in the 1980s, there was no such thing as a balanced encounter. You could be a, a level one player and run into a dragon, and you're like, eh, well, you're going to back out of here really quietly and hope he doesn't blow fire on us and burn us to a crisp. Um, because there was a lot more, I think, reliance on players making uh, decision-making beyond just combat. Not that it's right or wrong, it's just how the game used to be played. And there's some people that still like to, to be more strategic in role-playing and creative thinking rather than... than uh, uh, just, you know, casting spells and damage. And so to bring those types of players to the table or bring those people that aren't really concerned about balance encounter is how I add the, those two um, uh, vampire features in here. The vampire rage, where all the vampires disengage to engage just on one player character. And then the vampire retreat role, where if three vampires or more fall, you're going to roll this vampire retreat mechanic to see if the vampires try to escape and really putting the onus on you, the DM, to, to um, change the dynamics of the combat rather than kind of relying on those players, especially if you have those new players that don't know or don't think about uh, or haven't thought about that retreat or other strategic options are in the mix. So uh, I have all of those things in here. Again, here's all the vampires with their different magical items. They're all in here. I hope you really enjoy this. A couple of things on uh, Foundry that I want to point out here is I made the uh, windows on the upstairs uh, doors. Uh, and I did that because there's shutters. And I put a note in here just to, as reference. The windows are closed and the shutters are locked. It's going to take one action to open or break the window 
and, and bust open the shutters. Uh, the shutters I set to on the second floor to, to doors. And so that just makes it easier so you as a, a, a DM to, uh, on Foundry don't have to move walls or remove glass. glass. You can just go, oh, you busted open the shutter. They'll be able to see outside, jump down. Remember, it's on the, uh, you know, it's a 10 foot drop, drop, so it'll be a 1d6 damage for any players that drop out of here. And again, if the, the vampires try, try to retreat, they too might try to jump out of one of these these windows. Well, that's it for the Coffin Maker encounter. Again, this gorgeous map by DM Andy. Huge shout out to DM Andy. And again, to all of you Patreon members, thank you so much for your, your support, your well wishes. Please make sure to hit like, hit the bell icon to be reminded about new videos I'm putting up, and hit the subscribe. And if you're interested in being a Patreon member, down below this link, patreon.com forward slash Parm King. This is Parm King signing off. Thank you for your time and may all your roles be critically successful.